My name is Sam Vaknin and this is, this is part two of a two-part series about language, definitions, context and meaning. In this part we are going to discuss context and meaning or, as I like to put it, the meaning egg and the context chicken. Did the laws of nature precede nature or were they created with nature in the Big Bang? In other words, did the laws of nature provide nature with the context in which it has, it has unfolded? Some scholars like Max Tegmark, an MIT cosmologist, go as far as to say that mathematics is not merely the language that we use to describe the universe, it is the universe itself. The world is an amalgam of mathematical structures, according to Tegmark. The context is the meaning, is the context ad infinitum. By now, it is a trite observation to say that meaning is context-dependent and therefore not invariant, not immutable. Contextualists in aesthetics study a work of art's historical and cultural background in order to appreciate it fully. Philosophers of science have convincingly demonstrated that theoretical constructs such as the electron or dark matter derive their meaning from their place in complex deductive systems of empirically testable theorems. Ethicists repeat that values are rendered instrumental and moral problems solvable by their relationships with an a priori moral principle. In all these cases, context precedes meaning and gives interactive birth to meaning. However, the reverse is also true, unfortunately. Context emerges from meaning. Context is preceded by meaning. This is evident in a surprising array of fields, from language to social norms, from semiotics to computer programming, and from logic to animal behavior. In 1700, the English empiricist philosopher John Locke was the first to describe how meaning is derived from context in a chapter titled of the association in, of ideas in the second edition of his seminal essay concerning human, human understanding. Almost a century later, the philosopher James Mill and his son, John Stuart Mill, came up with a calculus of contexts, mental elements that are habitually proximate, either spe spatially or temporally, become associated, the contiguity law, as do ideas that co-occur frequently, the frequency law, or that are similar, the similarity law. But the Mills, father and son, fail to realize that their laws rely heavily on and derive from two organizing principles, time and space. These meta-principles lend meaning to ideas by rendering their associations comprehensible. And so the contiguity and frequency laws leverage meaningful spatial and temporal relations to form the context within which ideas associate. Context effects and gestalt and other vision grouping laws promulgated in the 20th century by the likes of Mark, eh, Max Wertheimer, Wertheimer, Irving Rock and Stephen Palmer also rely on the pre-existence of space for their operation. Context can have an empirical, uh, an exegetic kind of existence. They can have empirical or exegetic properties. In other words, contexts can act as webs or matrices and merely associate discrete elements or they can provide an interpretation of these recurrent associations. Context can red render these associations meaningful. The principle of causation is an example of such interpretative faculties of context in action. A is invariably followed by B, and a mechanism or process C can be demonstrated that links A with B. Thereafter, it is safe to say that A causes B. Space-time provides the backdrop of meaning to the context 
the recurrent association of A and B, which in turn gives rise to more meaning, causation. But are space and time real, objective entities, or are they instruments of the mind, mere conventions, tools the mind uses in order to order and structure the world? Surely the latter. It is possible to construct theories to describe the world and yield falsifiable predictions without using space or time, or by using counterintuitive or even counterfactual variants of space and time. Another Scottish philosopher, Alexander Baines, observed in the 19th century that ideas form close associations also with behaviours and actions. And this insight is at the basis uh, of most modern learning and conditioning behaviourist theories, and at the basis of connectionism, the design of neural networks where knowledge items are represented by patterns of activated ensembles of units. Similarly, memory has been proven to be state-dependent. Information learned in specific mental, physical or emotional states is most easily recalled in similar states. Conversely, in a process known as redintegration, mental and emotional states are completely invoked and restored when only a single element is encountered or experienced. A smell, a taste, a sight, in search of time lost. <laughs> so this is a trigger. It seems that the occult organizing mega principle is the mind or the self. Ideas, concepts, behaviors, actions, memories, and patterns presuppose the existence of minds that render them meaningful. Again, meaning, the mind or the self, Meaning breathes content, context, not the other way around. This does not negate the views expounded by externalist theories that thoughts and utterances depend on factors external to the mind of the thinker or the speaker. There are factors, such as the way language is used by experts or by society, that determine to some extent what you're going to say and what you're going to think. This is known as an externalist theory. Even, but even avowed externalists, such as Kripke, Burge, and Davidson, admit that the perception of objects and, and events by an observing mind is a prerequisite for thinking about or discussing objects and events. Again, the mind takes precedence a propos René Descartes. But what is meaning? And why is it thought to be determined by or dependent on context? Let's start with the language. Meaning and language, it's all in the mind. Many theories of meaning are contextualist. They prefer rules that connect sentence type and context of use to reference of singular terms, such as egocentric particulars, to truth values of sentences, and to the force of utterances and other linguistic acts. Meaning, in other words, is regarded by most theories as inextricably intertwined with language. Language is always context determined. Words depend on other words and on the world in which they refer, to which they relate. Take away the world and take away all other words and no word would have a meaning. Inevitably, meaning came to be described as context-dependent, too. The study of meaning was reduced to an exercise in semantics. Few have noticed that the context in which words operate depends on the individual meanings of these words. Gottlob Fröge coined the term Bedeutung. Bedeutung is reference to describe the mapping of words, predicates, and sentences onto real-world objects, concepts, or functions in the mathematical sense, and truth values, respectively. The truthfulness or falsehood of a sentence are determined by the interactions and relationships between the references of the various components of the sentence. 
meaning relies on the overall values of the references involved and on something that Frederick Frege called sin, sense. The way or the mode an object or a concept is referred to by an expression. The senses of the parts of the sentence combine to form the thoughts, senses of whole sentences. Yet, Freud's is an incomplete and mechanical picture that fails to capture the essence of human communication. It is meaning, the mind of the person composing the sentence, that breeds context and not the other way around. Even J. Even J. S. Mill postulated that a term's connotation, its meaning, its attributes, determines its denotation, the objects or concepts it applies to, the term's universe of applicability. As the Oxford Companion to Philosophy puts it, a context of a form of words is intentional, with an S, if its truth is dependent on the meaning and not just the reference of its component words, or on the meanings and not just the truth value of any of its subclasses. It is the thinker or the speaker, the user of the expression, that does the referring, not the expression itself. Moreover, as Kaplan and Kripke have noted in many cases, Frege's contraption of sense is, well, senseless and utterly unnecessary. Demonstrative, proper names, and natural kind terms, for example, refer directly through the agency of the speaker. When I call you by your name, it's a direct reference. Frege intentionally avoided the vexing question of why and how words refer to objects and concepts, because he was wary of the intuitive answer, later alluded to by H.P. Grice, the answer that users, minds, determine these link linkages and their corresponding truth values. Speakers use language to manipulate their listeners into believing in the manifest intentions behind their utterances. Cognitive, emotive and descriptive meanings all emanate from speakers and from the mind, minds of speakers. Initially, W. V. Quine put context before meaning. He not only linked meaning to experience, but also to empirically vetted, non-introspective world theories. It is the context of the, observe, of the observed behaviors of speakers and listeners that determines what words means, mean, he said. And so Quine and others attacked Carnap's meaning postulates logical connections as postulates governing predicates. They try to demonstrate that these postulates are not necessary unless one possesses a separate account of the status of logic, in other words, the context. And yet, this context-driven approach led to so many problems that soon Quine abandoned it and relented. Translate, translation he considered in his seminal tome, Word and Object, translation is indeterminate and reference is inscrutable. There are no facts when it comes to what words and sentences mean. What subjects say has no single meaning or determinately correct interpretation, when the various interpretations on offer are not equivalent and do not share the same truth value. As the Oxford Dictionary of Philosophy summarily puts it, inscrutability, Quine later called it indeterminacy, inscrutability of reference, uh, the doctrine that no empirical evidence relevant to interpreting a speaker's utterances can decide among alternative and inco incompatible ways of assigning reference to the word used. Let me try to rephrase it for you. It's a bit inscrutable. Indeterminacy or inscrutability of, of reference is a doctrine. It says that no, imp empirical, uh, rel uh, no empirical evidence relevant to interpreting someone's words 
can decide among alternative and incompatible ways of assigning reference to the words used. So there is no fact that the words have one reference or another. Even if all the interpretations are equivalent, they have the same truth value. Meaning comes before context, and it is not determined by context. Wittgenstein, in his later work, concurred. Inevitably, such a solipsistic view of meaning led to an attempt to introduce a more rigorous calculus based on concept on concepts or concept of truth rather than on the more nebulous construct of meaning. Both Donald Davidson and Alfred Tarski suggested that truth exists where sequences of objects satisfy parts of sentences. The meanings of sentences are their truth conditions, the conditions under which they are true. But this reversion to meaning truth determined by context results in bizarre outcomes bordering on tautologies. Number one, every sentence has to be paired with another sentence or even with itself, which endows it with meaning. This pairing of this other sentence endows it with meaning. Number two, every part of every sentence has to make a systematic, semantic contribution to the sentence in which they occur. And so to determine if a sentence is truthful, in other words, meaningful, one has to find another sentence that gives the first sentence meaning. Yet how do we know that the sentence that gives meaning is in itself truthful and therefore meaningful? This kind of ratiocination leads to infinite regression. And how do we measure the contribution of each part of a sentence to the sentence if we don't know the a priori meaning of the sentence itself? Finally, what is this so-called contribution, if not another name for, pardon me, meaning? Moreover, in generating a truth theory based on the specific utterances of a particular speaker, <coughs> one must assume <coughs> that the speaker is telling the truth, the principle of charity. <laughs> so it's, it's circular, it's tautological. And so belief language and meaning appear to be the facets of a single phenomenon. One cannot have either of these three without the others. It indeed is all in the mind, ultimately. We are back to the minds of interlocutors as the sources of both context and meaning. The mind as a field of potential meanings give, gives rise to the various contexts in which sentences can and are proven true, in other words, meaningful. Again, meaning precedes context and in turn fosters context. Proponents of epistemic or attributed contextualism link the propositions expressed even in knowledge sentences, X knows or doesn't know that Y, they link them to the attributed psychology, in this case as the context that endows them with meaning and truth values. Mind, again. Let's try to apply everything we've learned to the question of meaning, the meaning of life. On the one hand, to derive meaning in our lives, we frequently resort to social or cosmological contexts, to entities larger than ourselves, and in which we can safely feel subsumed, such as God, the nation-states, or Earth. Religious people believe that God has a plan into which they fit and in which they are destined to play a role. Nationalists believe in the permanence that uh, nations and states afford their own transient projects, subjects, and ideas. They equate permanence with worth, truth, and meaning. Environmentalists implicitly regard survival as the fount of meaning that is explicitly dependent on the preservation of a diversified and functioning ecosystem, and that's the context. Robert Nozick posited that finite beings, conditions, derive meaning from larger meaningful beings, conditions, and so ad infinitum. The buck stops with an infinite and all-encompassing being who is the source of all meaning.
God, in other words. On the other hand, Sidgwick and other philosophers pointed out that only conscious beings can appreciate life and its rewards, and that therefore the mind, consciousness, is the ultimate fount of all values and all meaning. Minds make value judgments and then proceed to regard certain situations and achievements as desirable, valuable, truthful or meaningful. Of course, this presupposes that happiness is somehow intimate, intimately connected with rendering one's life meaningful to start with. So, which is the ultimate contextual fount of meaning? The subject's mind? or his or her mainly social environment. This apparent dichotomy is false. As Richard Rorty and David A. Annis noted, one can't safely divorce epistemic processes such as justification from the social context in which they take place. As Sosa, Harman and later John Pollock and Michael Williams remarked, social expectations determine not only the standards of what constitutes knowledge, but also what it is that we know, the contents of knowledge. The mind is a social relational construct, as much as it is a neurological or a psychological one. To derive meaning from speech acts and utterances, we need to have asymptotically perfect information about both the subject discussed and the knowledge attributed psychology and social milieu. <clears throat> this is because the attributor's choice of language and ensuing justification are rooted in and responsive to both his psychology and his environment, including his personal history. Donald Duck to the rescue. <clears throat> Thomas Nagel suggested that we perceive the world from a series of concentric expanding perspectives, which he divides into internal and external. The ultimate point of view is that of the universe itself, as Sidgwick put it. Some people find it intimidating, others exhilarating. And here too, context mediated by the mind determines meaning. Whenever we discuss concept, uh, context, we need to clarify the concepts of boundary and trace. They're intimately intertwined. And they're both fuzzy. Physical boundaries are often the measurable manifestations of the operation of boundary conditions. They therefore have to do with discernible change, which in turn is inextricably linked to memory. A change state or entity are always compared to some things, states or entities that preceded them, or that are coterminous and co-spatial with them, but different to them. We deduce change by remembering what went before or what is different. We must distinguish memory from trace, though. They're not the same. In nature, memory is reversible. Metals with memories change back, back to erstwhile forms. People forget. Information disappears as entropy increases. Since memory is reversible, we have to rely on traces to reconstruct the past. Traces are thermodynamically irreversible. Black holes preserve in their event horizons all the information, all the traces regarding the characteristics, momentum, spin of the stars that had constituted or that they have assimilated. Indeed, the holographic principle in string theory postulates that the entire information regarding a volume of space can be fully captured by specifying the data regarding its light-like boundary, its gravitational horizon. And so boundaries can be defined as the area that delimits one set of traces and separates them from another set of traces. The very essence of physical, including biological bodies, is the composite outcome of multiple cumulative intricately interacting traces of past processes and past events traces. These interactions are at the core of entropy on both the physical and info informational levels. As Jacob Beckenstein wrote in 2003, thermodynamic entropy and Shannon entropy are conceptually equivalent. 
the number of arrangements that are counted by Boltzmann entropy reflects the amount of Shannon information one would need to implement any particular arrangement of matter and energy. Yet how does one apply these twin concepts of trace, boundary, to less tangible and more complex situations? Physics is simple. But what is the meaning of psychologi psychological boundaries, political boundaries? These types of boundaries equally depend on boundary conditions, or albeit man-made ones. Akin to their physical, biological brethren, boundaries that pertain to humankind in its myriad manifestations are rule-based. Where the laws of nature generate boundaries by retaining traces of physical and biological change, the laws of man create boundaries by retaining traces, history, of personal, organizational, and political change. These traces are what we mistakenly and colloquially call memory. We use symbols in our traces. Our traces are comprised, in vast majority of cases, of symbols. And symbols, supposedly, are connected to essence. Our origins in Australia believe that the entire universe is regenerated whenever they chant their song lines, Yui. This is reminiscent of the Copenhagen interpretation of quantum mechanics, which postulates that particles, and really the entire world, are the outcomes of choices made by observers, the collapse of the wave function. The ancient Hebrews, and many Orthodox Jews to this very day, swear by the miraculous power of their alphabet and its numerical equivalent, gematria. The real name of God is so potent that it is never to be uttered, lest it wreaks havoc and calamity on the world. It, the name of God on, a, on parchment renders the golem alive. Christian tradition equates Jesus Christ with the word Logos, the word that brought our universe into existence. This kind of magical thinking regards symbols not as representations, but as hand handles attached firmly to real life objects. There are three types of symbols. Symbols that reflect intrinsic mental states. As Locke had observed, here the symbol is the essence, though awareness and enlightenment are required as the context in which these symbols can operate and evoke the inner landscape that they represent. A second type of symbol is symbols that stand in stand in for ex extrinsic, actual or objective conditions or objects. Here the symbol is a representation and as Wittgenstein famously commented, it requires interpretation or mapping before it can resolve appropriately. Mapping therefore is not merely reference. It relates both to the outside world and to the state of knowledge and experience of the subject as in psychologism or logical positivism. We combine representation and interpretation, strong subjective input of secondary qualities to yield perception and a description of the world. Still, the mental representation engendered by the symbol must share primary qualities with the object that it represents. This correspondence, this sharing of qualities, has survival value in that it fosters monovalent communication. When you say tiger, it better be a tiger. The third class of symbols consists of symbols that stand in relation to cultural artifacts or constructs or memes. Here the symbol and the object it represents are one and the same. Any distinction between symbol and symbolized is spurious, is wrong. Combinations, strings of symbols, produce meaningful statements, which really amount to compounded symbols. The same rules and taxonomy apply to them as to their more fundamental and simpler building blocks. But if symbols are intrinsically meaningful, how come we fail to immediately and directly comprehend foreign languages, or to the uninitiated mathematics? They are made of symbols. Why don't we immediately apprehend them and you know, immediately grasp? 
The answer is that we lack the context or the theory that will allow us to translate from one language to another. Symbols refer to reality or stand in for it only within semantic fields. Even then, and contrary to Quine's dictum, even then we can always produce a set of workable, albeit inaccurate, translations, functional translation hypotheses. Let's try to apply what we've learned to a fascinating topic, waste. What is waste? Why is something considered to be waste? when a minute before it has been a useful object. Waste is considered to be the byproduct of both natural and artificial processes, manufacturing, chemical reactions and events in biochemical pathways. But how do, we, how do we distinguish the main products of an activity from its byproducts? How do we distinguish background from context, context from meaning, meaning from truthfulness, because only meaningful, truthful, context-embedded objects are useful. When they are not, they constitute waste. In industry, we intend to manufacture the former, the main products, and often get the latter, the byproducts as well. And so our intention seems to be the determining factor here. Main products we want and plan to obtain, byproducts are the unfortunate, albeit inevitable outcomes of the process, collateral damage in a way. We strive to maximize the former even as we minimize the latter. This distinction, though, is not ironclad. Sometimes we generate waste on purpose and its fostering becomes our goal. Consider, for instance, diuretics, whose sole aim is to enhance the output of urine, widely considered to be a waste product. Dogs use urine to mark and demarcate their territory. They secrete it deliberately on trees, shrubs, hedges and lawns. So, is the dog's urine waste? To us, it certainly is. But what about the dog? He wouldn't consider it waste. And what about byproducts which are not useful at a given period in history, but then decades later or centuries later find their uses and are long, no longer waste products? Natural processes involve no intention. There, in nature, to determine what constitutes byproducts, we need another differential criterion. We know that nature is parsimonious. Yet all natural systems yield waste. That's wasteful. <laughs> it seems it's not effective, not efficient. But nature is supposed to be 100% efficient. It seems that waste is an integral part of nature's optimal solution and that therefore it is necessary. It is efficient. Waste is useful. It is common knowledge that one's waste is another's food or raw material. This is the principle behind bioremediation in the fertilizers industry. Recycling is therefore a misleading and anthropocentric term because it implies that cycles of production and consumption invariably end and have to somehow be restarted. But in reality, substances are constantly used, secreted, reused, expelled, absorbed, and so on and so forth by numerous organisms in chains ad infinitum. Moreover, what is unanimously considered to be waste at one time or in one location or under certain circumstances is frequently regarded to be a precious and much sought after commodity in a different epoch elsewhere and with the advance and advantage of knowledge and science. It is safe to say that, subject to the right frame of reference, there is no such thing as waste. Perhaps the best examples are an intergalactic spaceship, a space colony or a space station, where nothing goes to waste and literally every refuse has its reuse. It is helpful to consider the difference in how waste is perceived in open versus closed systems. From the self-interested point of view of an open system, waste is wasteful. It requires resources to get rid of, exports energy and raw materials, 
when it is discharged and endangers the system if it accumulates. From the point of view of the closed system, for example the universe, all raw materials are inevitable, necessary and useful. Closed system, systems produce no such thing as waste. All the subsystems of a closed system merely process and convey to each other the very same substances. It's a transmission mechanism over and over again in an eternal, unbreakable cycle. But why the need for such transport and expenditure of energy? You know, why, why do we need this? Why do systems perpetually trade raw materials among themselves? In an entropic universe, all activity will cease and the distinction between waste and useful substances and products will no longer exist, even for open systems. Luckily, we are far from there. <laughs> Order and complexity still, still thrive in isolated pockets, on Earth, for example. As these increase, so does waste. Indeed, waste can be construed to be the secretion and expulsion from orderly and complex systems of disorder and low-level order. As waste inside an open system decreases, order is enhanced and the system becomes more organized, less chaotic, more functional and more complex. It behooves us to distinguish between waste and garbage. Waste is the inadvertent and coincidental, although not necessarily random or unpredictable, outcome of processes while garbage is integrated into manufacturing and marketing ab initio. And so packing materials end up as garbage, as do disposable items, plastics, and so on. It would seem that the usability of a substance determines if it is thought of as waste or not. Even then, quantities and qualities matter. Many stuffs are useful in measured amounts, but poisonous beyond a certain quantitative threshold. The same substance in one state is raw material, in another state is waste. As long as an object or substance function, they're not waste. But the minute they stop serving us, they're labeled as such. Consider defunct e-waste and corpses, for example. In an alien environment, how would we be able to tell waste from the useful? The short and the long of it, we wouldn't. To determine if something is waste, we would need to observe it, its interactions with its environment and the world in which it operates, in order to determine its usefulness and actual uses. Our ability to identify waste is therefore the result of accumulated knowledge. The concept of waste is so anthropocentric and dependent on human prejudices that it is very likely spurious, a mere construct devoid of any objective ontological content or sense. This view is further enhanced by the fact that the words waste and wasteful carry negative moral and social connotations. It is wrong and bad to waste money or time or food. Waste is thus rendered a mere value judgment specific to its time, place and purveyors. Context dependent and mind dependent. So, the last issue I would like to discuss when we, when we deal with context and meaning is the issue of original versus copy and how this question relates to context. Consider the following conundrums. Number one, a brilliant geek invents a 3D printer which replicates flawlessly the Mona Lisa. Leonardo's masterpiece and the copy spewed out by the machine are indistinguishable even under an electron microscope. They cannot be told apart. In which sense, therefore, is Leonardo's Mona Lisa superior or different from its identical clone? Number two, an ancient letter unearthed in the archives of the church in France proves beyond any doubt that the Mona Lisa was not painted by Leonardo da Vinci but by an obscure apprentice of Leonardo's. The painting's value drops overnight, even though it has undergone no physical or chemical transformation. Number three, a world-renowned photographer uses the latest in digital photography equipment to shoot the Mona Lisa 
in a thought-provoking fresh manner. The resulting over the resulting work becomes a sensation of a night. He then proceeds to attach the photo to 15,000 email messages, and he sends these messages to his entire voluminous address book. In which sense is the photo that he had shot more worthwhile than these numerous digital replicas and copies of the photo? Intuitively, we feel that Leonardo's Mona Lisa is not the same as its clones and that its monetary value and intrinsic worth depend crucially on its provenance, its authorship, the historical background, and its proven biography. The concepts of originality and authenticity, therefore, have little to do with the work of art itself and everything to do with its context. This realization is thrown into even sharper relief in the third conundrum, where the only thing separating one digital copy, the original, from another is chronology. The original preceded all the others, temporarily, as it was shot first. We took a tour of the world of context and how it yields meaning via the human mind. Ultimately, it all starts in the human mind. Everything, none of it is objective. None of it is truthful. None of it is meaningful. In the absence of a human mind, all these are arbitrary, cold objects hurtling in space, meaningless, truthless, just there. Thank you for listening.